race to win wars and explore the stars, have created some of the most fantastic products ever designed, and we use them every day, unaware of their amazing origins. On Wicked Inventions, the Swiss Army Knife, an entire toolkit in a pocket-sized red package. The Winglet, a NASA-developed design that now helps you jet across the globe. The English Saddle. We saddle up and explain how a horse riding essential created the shock troops of the Middle Ages. We reveal the amazing science and manufacture behind these wicked inventions. Throughout the centuries, an army's success has depended on the quality of the kit they use as much as the tactics deployed in the heat of battle. One of the key things for every soldier, every infantryman, wants to be able to carry all his kit with him. And the lighter it can be and the most functional it can be enhances his capability on the battlefield. From the Romans of antiquity to the modern military forces of today, mobility and flexibility are the key words to describe the most effective fighting forces of history. And their equipment has to reflect this. Which is why you might be surprised to find a product living in a drawer at home, which was developed to meet this military need, and has entered common language as the definition of multi-purpose. The Swiss Army Knife. I think the Swiss Army Knife is an incredible innovation. The great advantage of a Swiss Army knife is that it encompasses a huge number of, of capabilities, lots of instruments and implements in a very small device. And I remember certainly when I was a small boy, every time we went on holiday to Switzerland or so, it, it was something that you just look at and think, gosh, I just wish I could own one. The idea of incorporating several tools in a small portable unit is not a new one. The Romans had their very own version of a Swiss Army knife nearly 2,000 years ago, complete with spoon, fork, blade and the obligatory toothpick. Made from solid silver, this luxury item and the idea for a multi-tool seems to have been lost in time, and from the 1600s, the basic pocket knife became the handy tool of choice. In the 1880s, the Swiss Army decided to replace their own pocket knife and a revolutionary new product was born. It was developed in order to enable the soldiers to dismantle their rifle and to clean it, and also to open canned food. Therefore, it needed two attachments, a tin opener and a screwdriver. So the solution was the model 1890, which was a knife manufactured by the company Vester Co., which is actually a German company. So the original model 1890 Swiss Army knife was actually German. A year later, businessman Karl Elsner took the production of the knife to the Swiss town of Eibach and started improving its design and the number of tools it could carry. Karl Elsner refined that design by adding a core screw and scissors. And this model, he called it the Schweiz Officer Messer, which actually means Swiss officer knife. And after the Second World War, the Schweizer Officer Messer was actually hard for Americans to pronounce. So they decided to nickname it the Swiss Army Knife. With over 800 tools to choose from, the Victoria Knox factory in Eibach produces 350 different versions of the knife, with an eye-watering 17 million knife parts being manufactured every year. The manufacturing process starts by a 3mm thick coil of high-quality stainless steel being fed into a punching machine. The metal is forced against the die to punch out the basic blade shapes, including the nail groove used to open the knife. A single coil contains enough steel for 30,000 blades to be punched in one pass. The other tools, such as the can opener, are made in the same way. The blades are then fed into a machine that contains a vibrating mixture of stones and water, which polishes the steel. Once polished, a powerful magnet removes the blades from the stones. The blades are still far too thick and this machine grinds them flat to within a tolerance of two hundredths of a millimetre, less than the width of a human hair. 
to prevent them jamming when the knife is opening and closing. At this point, the blades are stamped with their trademark and then enter a furnace that is heated to 1050 degrees Celsius. Once heated to the correct temperature, the blades are quickly cooled, which hardens and toughens the metal further. When you heat up the steel, its inner structure changes and a structure called martensite is being created. Martensite is a very hard structure. It makes the steel stay sharp for a long time and guarantee long longevity. Once the blade is sharpened, it is ready for assembly. The shape of the blade includes a notch at the back of the knife edge, which is part of an opening and closing system for pocket knives that has been in existence for over 300 years. This is called a slip joint. Slip joint knives have an internal spring, which is more like a small piece of metal, and this spring needs to be overcome in order to close and open the knife. The flagship Victoria Knox knife is the Swiss Champ, with a whopping 33 different tools. This hand-assembled, multi-tooled wonder starts life with four pins that all the parts will slot onto to create one big metal sandwich. A mixture of tools, spacers, springs and attachments are built up to form the Champ, with metal fittings called bushings machined onto the pins to fix the tool together. The blade is then given a final finish. The advantages of creating the knives in this way allows them to customize and to make all sorts of knives from one simple station. The distinctive red plastic handles of the Swiss Army knife are called scales, and these are made in the factory's injection molding department and are emblazoned with the Victoria Knox shield, ready to be attached to the finished tool. Two scales are placed into a machine and the tool bundle is placed between them and the scales are pushed down to fix the scales to the bushings. The three centimeter wide tool is now finished, but all 33 of its attachments still need to be checked before it can be sent out to over 120 countries around the world. The company has been very good at marketing it and, and continue to develop it uh, over the years. They also have um, things like USB sticks and you know, credit card size, so they're clearly moving with the times and um, producing something which is relevant for today. I think the Army Knife is not only uh, an amazing product, but it's also a product that managed to reach the state of an icon. And only a few products in the world have managed to reach that state. Whether it is jetting across the globe on business or getting away for your annual two weeks in the sun, air travel has become a familiar part of everyday life. We are confident that the jet or propeller engine will push the aircraft into the sky. But how many of us actually understand the science behind what keeps it up there? It's the wings I hear you cry, and indeed you would be right. But how do they work? And have you ever wondered what those vertical wingtips that have appeared on airliners actually do? And what connects them with NASA? It all begins with understanding how an aircraft wing actually works. With wings, you normally have a curved surface, which means the air that's going over on a normal plane top surface of the wing has further to go than the air that's on the lower surface. If the air on the top surface has got to go uh, further than the air on the lower surface, then it's got to travel faster. And that generates effectively a low pressure on the top surface and a high pressure on the lower surface. And it's essentially the pressure difference that generates a vertical force. So the bigger the wing, the bigger the force. This amazing aerodynamic principle has been the secret to powered flight ever since the Wright brothers first flew in 1903. But the difference in air pressures around a wing also generate less favorable characteristics, namely wingtip vortices. A wingtip vortex is created as high pressure air leaks from below the surface of the wingtip. This high pressure air spills over the tip and into low pressure space above the wing. This behavior creates a path of swirling air that trails each wingtip, with its strength and size determined by many factors, including the aircraft's weight and airspeed. On a large plane, you might see really big vortices coming off the wingtips and getting um, shed off down, maybe sticking in the air for uh, a couple of miles or so, and it also detracts from the efficiency of the, of the aircraft. 
And you can get additional drag from the formation of vortices and, and the mess, the losses that, that come associated with that. Drag is not the only negative aspect of wingtip vortices. Vortices are also a component part of wake turbulence, which is the disturbed air that forms behind an aircraft as it moves. This turbulence can potentially be a dangerous hazard for any following aircraft. If you imagine the difference between flying into air which is uniformly coming towards you, and then you imagine flying through a vortex which is effectively spinning, um, depending on the size of vehicle that you're in and, you're, and the position of the vehicle compared to those vortices, they can have the power to flip aircraft over. If you're coming to land a small plane on the same runway, for example, where a large plane has either just taken off or just, just landed, then that can be pretty dangerous. Dangerous turbulence, drag, now this is where NASA and winglets come in. The winglet is not a new concept, with the earliest example dating back to 1910. In its most basic form, a winglet is an angled extension of a wingtip that sits at 90 degrees to the wing. Traditionally, this extension sunk below the wing, such as the example on the German Heinkel 162A from World War II. So what are these designs trying to achieve? The idea behind a winglet is effectively to provide a boundary for the flow which is attempting to wrap from the pressure surface of a wing onto the suction surface of the wing. So you're trying to reduce the effect of this tip vortex. The design and placement of winglets are critical to their performance. In response to the oil crisis of 1973, which saw an incredible rise in the cost of fuel, NASA engineer Richard T. Whitcomb developed the near-vertical winglet design we are so familiar with today. It had always been noted by aerodynamicists that soaring birds in flight, such as eagles, glided with near-vertical wingtips. If it was good enough for the birds, then it was good enough for NASA. Whitcomb came up with small vertical airfoils, and by 1976, his research concluded that winglets employed on transport size aircraft could diminish induced drag by approximately 20%, and improve the overall aircraft lift to drag ratio by 6 to 9%. 20 years later, the commercial airline industry started to see the benefits of adding a blended winglet to their own fleet's wings. You can generate the same amount of lift for a narrower span wing, so it can be lighter, which means you, you, you don't need as much force um, to keep it in the air, and they can effectively reduce the angle of attack. So normally, higher angle of attack usually comes with a, a penalty, which is drag. So winglets provide a drag reduction so it'll run more efficiently, so you can run less fuel. And they have the ability to stabilise a vehicle if they're in the right position. There are now a wide variety of winglet designs and manufacturers, and it has been calculated that planes with winglet designs can see fuel savings of between 4 to 6%. What does that mean? Well, it has been predicted by one manufacturer that their blended wings will have saved over 5 billion gallons of fuel since their introduction 15 years ago. As a result, billions of dollars have been saved and tens of millions of tonnes less carbon dioxide has been emitted into the atmosphere. So, the next time you jet off into the skies, have a look out of the window and you might find a piece of technology that was inspired by an eagle and helps you fly to your dream destination. The Winglet. Truly a wicked invention. The winglet might be saving airlines the world over a great deal of money, but can we test the benefits of this nifty piece of design ourselves? We've come to our own handy airfield to find out. The experiment. Beloved by bored schoolboys and frustrated flyers everywhere, the paper plane is the classic low-cost entry into the world of aviation. To begin, we create five identical paper planes. Each flyer is made from a piece of red A4 paper, using the standardised folding technique refined over many generations of classroom chaos. Now for the winglet planes. Using green paper this time, well, this is fuel-saving technology, five other identical paper planes are made. The winglets are created by folding the wing two centimetres in on themselves. This creates a 10 centimetre long winglet that should reduce the aircraft's drag and stabilise it in flight. 
or so the theory goes. Our flight area is laid out with markings placed every 10 feet. Now the test can begin. Each plane will be released five times to reduce any inconsistencies that may occur during each flight. A consistent release is critical and our tester exhibits the perfect technique. A wide stance, shoulders back, perfect arm bending action. The planes are released and we soon get to see how the winglet adapted planes perform against their standardized cousins. After a hectic barrage of paper projectiles, the results are in. In this shot, we have plotted where each of the red planes landed. If we overlay the green flights, I think we can see a clear winner. The winglets are victorious, with one green plane actually achieving the longest flight distance, a fabulous 40 feet. So there you have it, point proved. The winglet really is an aerodynamic wonder. The saddles of today have their origins firmly planted in military history. The first depictions of the saddle show the Assyrian cavalry from 700 BC. In these early carvings, we can see warriors riding horses seated upon a piece of cloth or leather, secured by straps not too dissimilar to the horse tack of today. But it was the introduction of stirrups to the saddle that would cause a military revolution. A mounted warrior, sitting atop a saddle with stirrups, had now gained all kinds of advantages in combat. Having the stirrups added to the saddle just changes completely the way you can fight on the back of a horse. You can stand up, you have a platform if you like. So say you had a sword in your hand, foot soldiers coming charging towards you, you can stand up in your horse, you can reach out and you can really go for that foot soldier without slipping and falling off the side of the horse. The tribes of Central Asia were some of the first peoples to understand the decisive advantage this new mobile warfare offered. A succession of tribes and nomadic groups, such as the Sarmatians and Mongols, seemed to spend their lives in the saddle, conquering large swathes of territory using a rapid and mobile form of warfare on horseback. These nomadic rampages through Western Europe did introduce the stirrup to a new European warrior class, who quickly took up the idea and established the ultimate in heavy cavalry the mounted knight. When we think of knights, armoured knights, we can think of uh, the Norman time, the Norman invasion, 11th century, that kind of uh, period, and it got refined through the medieval ages. These knights dressed in their armour, on the speed of their horse, and their lance couched under their arm, the stability of the saddle and the stirrups meant that all that power is transferred down the end of that point. They would drive through, punch holes through the enemy lines, a little bit like the modern day tank. Nearly 3,000 years on from those first Assyrian carvings, saddles are still being made all over the world. In Warsaw, England, the saddle company continues the ancient art of saddle making. The four components of the saddle are the tree, the frame the saddle's built on, the seat of the saddle, we have the side flaps of the saddle, and then the underside of the saddle, which consists of the panel that sits against the horse. So really, you can break a saddle down into four component parts in that way. As a master saddler with 48 years experience, David Johnson's saddles are made using combination of craftsmanship and the use of modern techniques and materials to improve the performance of a saddle today. When I was apprentice, we did a six year apprenticeship and at the end of six years, I could probably make five saddles a week. Here, one of our guys will make four to five a day, but that's just through using modern techniques and designing new ways of producing them. Saddles are made for both the horse and the rider in terms of comfort and durability. Like us, horses come in all shapes and sizes and every saddle needs to be tailored to comfortably fit each individual horse. The fit is the most important thing of all now because it doesn't matter if you've paid two pounds for a saddle or you've paid 2,000 pounds for a saddle. If that two pound saddle fits better, than the 2,000 pound saddle, then that's the better saddle to ride on. It's gonna be more comfortable for the horse. For this saddle, the tree is made from polyurethane. A flexible metal strip called a gullet plate is attached to the tree. This plate can be adjusted to create a tailored fit for the horse once the saddle is finished. Next, they rivet a stirrup bar through the tree, which will be used to attach the stirrups to the saddle. 
An adhesive is brushed onto the tree and a foam pad is glued into position. Another thicker foam pad is added for cushioning. A knife is then used to trim the foam. A template is then used to trace the seat shape and the foam is roughly cut into shape. A tool called a rasp is then used to graze away excess foam and give the seat a defined size and shape. While the saddle seat is being shaped, another worker starts to cut out the leather pieces that will make up saddle flaps and cover the tree. The guy will, from the order, be able to distinguish what seat size, what model, what colour, any little extras it may require. That will all be done and prepared in the cutting department. First of all, he inspects the leather for any defects. He carefully traces the different pieces that make up the saddle with chalk. The leather is expensive, so it is very important to arrange the pieces to have the least amount of waste. The guys will cut the parts, some panels will be cut out by a steel knife, some panels will be cut by hand with card, and then we'll move on to the preparation department where you'll see the ladies preparing the work for the machinist to be machined. The leather pieces are then fed into a skiving machine. This machine shaves the edges of the leather. These edges, now thinner, will be easier to stitch later on in the process. A glue is applied to the cut pieces to hold them together before a machinist will permanently stitch them into place. In the preparing department, they will mark and glue parts that are to be machined and not stay permanently glued in some cases. It will have to use a glue that can actually be taken apart again once the parts have been machined together. The two pieces are pushed together with the aid of a tool made from whalebone. This material is used as it does not scratch or scar the leather. A machinist then stitches the pieces of leather together. It goes back and forwards a couple of times between the preparation and the machine department. With the leather pieces prepared and machined, a saddle maker starts to construct the saddle. The guy has four basic component parts he needs to assemble. At the tree, the flaps, the panel and the seat. To begin, the worker stuffs the panel with a mixture of wool and synthetic materials. Two panels will be attached to the underside of the saddle. The panels are designed for the horse's comfort, with one sitting on each side of its back. Next, the leather seat cover is attached to the tree. The cover is pulled over the tree and fixed in place with a pneumatic stapler. An experienced eye is all important, as the saddle maker trims away excess leather and shapes the cover into position. You will see a lot of measuring going on hopefully, where they're checking that things are going in symmetrically and correctly. With the seat firmly in position on the tree, the flaps, panel, straps and various fixings and buckles are brought together and stapled into position. The panel is the last piece to be attached and after stapling it to the back of the saddle, the front is hand stitched to the pommel. This is called lacing it in. The saddle is now complete and ready to be shipped nearly 12,000 miles away to its new owner in New Zealand. So the saddle, thousands of years of military development yet used for more peaceful pursuits today. Now that is a wicked invention. So there you have it, a dash through the hidden history, super science and amazing manufacture of products that you use every day, but have never realised their amazing background. The Swiss Army knife, the winglet and the saddle, all wicked inventions.